The Magic Show is brought to you by StarCityGames.com, and check this out. On August 31st and September 1st, the StarCityGames.com Open Series comes to Cincinnati, and this event is going to be huge. We're talking hundreds of players, a standard open with $10,000 in prizes paid down to 64th place, a legacy open with $10,000 in prizes paid down to 64th place, at least 16 players qualifying for any of the next four SCG Invitationals, live coverage all weekend long courtesy of SCG Live, and as much Magic the Gathering as we can pack into one weekend. So make plans to join us when the StarCityGames.com Open Series comes to Cincinnati, and we'll see you there. Everybody and welcome to another edition of the Magic Show and my first ever top 10 show. Theros will be here before you know it, but this show I want to go over my top 10 cube cards. Now what's a cube? Why, it's your own personal draft format. It's devised of some number of each color of artifacts, lands, and multicolor cards. I've had mine since 2005, where I read up on Sam Gummersall's article, Gleaming the Cube, and I was hooked. You can find my cube and its updates at cubedrafting.com. Now, my cube includes power cards, that is, Black Lotus and every single Mox, also Time Walk and Ancestral Recall. We don't speak a Time Twister. We don't speak of it. Just so we can get some really cool variety in this list, I am not listing Black Lotus, the Mox, and Time Walker, Ancestral Recall. They live in their own planet of awesome, and they are in a class unto themselves. Okay, so... Here are my top 10 cards in cube. If you want another way to think of this list, imagine that these are the top 10 first picks from your first cube pack. I'll also be listing the most pimp version of the cards in question, usually the hardest to find or shiniest versions that exist. Number 10. Sylvan Library. First up comes the best green card in the cube. Sylvan Library joined us in Legends, where Wizards was still busy not knowing what the hell they were doing in terms of magic card design, and designing gold cards for the first time, they cranked out such wonders as Urdrago, a 7-mana 4-4 with first strike who, wait for it, stops other swamp walkers. Oh, now you're playing with power, baby! But seriously, Sylvan Library breaks the mold because it is both card draw in the form of Pain Life, which is totally Black's Realm, and card selection, which is totally Blue's Realm. This guy is smack in the middle of Design Mistakesville, whose population will be continuously visiting throughout the show. So you get a free Sensei's Divining Top activation on your draw step just by this existing, and if you gain life in some way, such as Face Fetters or an active Primeval Bounty, you're drawing at least two cards a turn, and with Fetch Lands and Shuffle Effects, you're seeing a ton of cards very quickly never a card you're leaving in the sideboard if you're playing green it is one of the very best green cards ever made in the history of magic the super pimp version commander's arsenal foil the only foil version the only new frame version currently at 50 bucks a pop number nine Recurring Nightmare. We go from the best green card to the best black one. Recurring Nightmare is all about the synergy, and Lord knows it had it back in the day, as Survival of the Fittest and Recurring Nightmare were both legal and standard at the same time. Considering they were from the same friggin' set, Wizards was a little heavy-handed on the hint hint, here's a deck bra thing back in the day. Anyway, Recurring Nightmare can quickly create, uh, wait for it, Nightmare Scenarios. Yeah, all week. Yeah. I'm sorry. Deranged Tournament is a big favorite with Recurring Nightmare, as you can sack those little squirrels and get back all the fatties you put in your yard within Tomb or card filters like Looter Ilkor or Faithless Looting. Getting a fatty in the yard is crucial, particularly one with sweet enters the battlefield abilities like the Hornet Queen or Terastodon. Of course, throwing in a Necrotal kills any problems, and sacking and returning Mold Drifters is just all kinds of fun. Needless to say, this card is powerful and can quickly alter your draft strategy and what cards you begin valuing over others. The Super Pimp version? If you're a player who likes foreign, the Korean version is really rare, but unfortunately this has no foil version or any alternate art option. Sadness. Number 8. Sword of Fire and Ice. Oh, our first artifact and an equipment even. This guy debuted all the way back in Darksteel in Mirrodin Block where Watsi made equipment for the first time and per usual had no idea what they were doing. Bone Splitter, one of the most powerful equipments pound for pound, was common and crushes to this day. And these swords, they are real fair. If it weren't for the affinity menace at the time, these things would have made an even bigger splash on standard than they did. But that's okay because they sure did crush and limited and in cube it shines even brighter. Why? Because red and blue you know, happen to be a wee bit okay in cube. Blue, most would argue, is the best color in the cube, and red is the best color to burn your creatures to bits. Of course, the advantage this card gives you is just awesome. Drawing cards and killing things, often a two for one just for connecting, and oh yeah, it gets plus two, plus two on top. It's arguable that Sword of Feast and Famine is more powerful, as Cobblade destroyed Pro Tour Paris, giving Ben Stark a trophy and showing just how powerful getting an extra turn's worth of mana per whack really is. But when it comes to cube, 
Feast and Famine just doesn't compare to the raw power of fire and ice. Super Pimp version? The Modern Masters foil version is a whopping three times more expensive than the incredibly rare Judge foil. Just relish in that $174.99 sticker price, peeps. Number 7. Treachery. Oh, the untapped mechanic. Printed on nine cards, almost all of them infamous. I mean, the game didn't break because Paragon Drake exists or anything, and Rewind is printed to this day. But Wizards was a little freaked out when cards like Allurin and number nine on our list, Recurring Nightmare, began breaking stuff in Standard and Extended. For a while, Great Whale and Palancron were eroded to say they only untapped the lands, quote, if you played it from your hand, but that was famously reversed in 2006 as detailed in Aaron Forsythe's article, Power Level Errata Be Gone. Now, as you can imagine, Control of Magic effects are pretty sweet. There are plenty in the cube, which, if you expand your definition enough, can include not just Control Magic and Treachery, but Soul of Temptation, Gilded Drake, and even Bribery. Take Possession is a card that I've ran in my cube before, but don't currently, and is another terrific option. But when it comes to Control Magic effects, nothing is as powerful as Treachery. For the decks that run Treachery, that is, blue decks, you need your mana available to counter spells and not sinking into Control Magic effects. This gets you the best creature on the other side of the table with all of your shields up and ready to counter or kill anything in your path during their turn. There are fewer satisfactions than beating your opponent with their own monster. It's like the stop hitting yourself game, except their fist is in the form of the scariest monster they got. Super Pimp version? Only printed in Urza's Destiny, and never to be reprinted again thanks to the reserve list. This foil is worth 60 bucks. Cha-ching, and uh, I'll take that creature. Thanks. Number 6. Umazawa's Jite. Mistakes. Watsy's made a few, and as we get higher on the list, you'll begin to see a pattern of them. This little guy, he was the classic last minute change. Back in development, the minus one minus one ability was originally add two colorless mana. This caused weird rules issues in that you could pithy needle Umazawa Jite, but since one of the abilities was a mana ability, you could still use it, and it was just easier to keep a creature specific and give another creature minus one minus one, right? Yeah, yeah, that. That was a great idea. Because all of a sudden, first strikers were insane, and between gaining life and pumping and shrinking, this singular artifact can dominate a game almost instantly. Hell, at the time, in standard, some control decks would play copies of this card just to counter opposing aggro decks' copies. That's insane! But that's what some matches devolved into. It was a dirty jete jete world out there, and we were just living in it. In the cube, of course this thing dominates. Basically, every deck wants it, from control to aggro and everything in between, simply due to its incredibly oppressive nature. Hitting an opponent just once lets you draw another card from Sylvan Library, pulls you out of Alpha Strike range, kills two X1s, or messes up combat in a freakish way. Lastly, note that this little monster doesn't need to be equipped to use its abilities, so even after you Wrath of God or Damnation, it will still be messed with you, this card will always haunt Watsi as a lesson on the danger of last minute changes. Super Pimp version? While a Grand Prix foil exists, they just gave too many away. The original Betrayers of Kamigawa foil is up to 130 bucks, And we'll be right back with the rest of our list. The IQ program is a little bit unique as far as competitive level tournaments you get at a store level. It's a larger event, it's a, a better opportunity for players to get an experience where they have kind of high stakes competitive level event, but in an environment that they're comfortable with and that they're familiar with. The program itself is very organized. Star City definitely has a lot of experience in running this kind of thing and in putting it together. They're really responsive and they really want to support the stores that are supporting the program. And it gives players valuable experience before they go to a more high stakes event like an SCG Open or if they qualify here at, say, an Elite IQ, actually going to an Invitational itself. I feel like the player response has been very positive. We get a lot of compliments. It's important to us that players come out here and have a really good experience. Number five, Elspeth, Knight Errant. Oh man, Elspeth, Knight Errant. Such an incredibly beautiful image, such an incredibly overpowered planeswalker. One of the best things about magic is that R&D keeps trying new things. And every time they get some crazy new idea, mechanic, or card type, we players get to bask in the pushing of the gas pedal a wee bit too hard after taking things out for their first spin. Now, Shards of Alara were the second wave of planeswalkers after the first five, and they gave us two notoriously powerful planeswalkers that remain in my cube to this day, Elspeth here and a Johnny Vengeance. Sargon Ball stuck around for a very long 
time until spring 2013 when Gatecrash's own Domery Rod replaced him, which says a lot for a car to stick around the cube five years. But Elspeth? Elspeth is one for the ages. This girl is five years old and is running strong. Entire decks bow down to this girl, not having a way to stop the onslaught of soldiers, the angelic blessing ability, and the fact that both of these abilities are plus ones, which, to be clear, is absolutely huge, and the number one reason this card is bonkers. Going from no board to a five loyalty planeswalker who just made a 1-1 one, one that can turn into a 4-4 four, four flyer next turn or keep making 1-1s one, and whose loyalty is then 6, that's powerful, powerful stuff. Crushing standard in her time and turning every game after she's cast into a game of how in the hell do I deal with Elspeth, this is definitely worthy of top 5 status. Now the Super Pimp version, while Modern Masters foil is up there, the original is king. Clocking in at a crisp $100 bill, the Shards of Alara Elspeth rules all. Number 4, Library of Alexandria. Man, the lands back in the day were so insane. Library not only draws you cards for free and isn't legendary, so enjoy playing lots of them, it also tapped for mana, because you know, YOLO. Now let's note that while the design team were still in the I don't know what we're doing here mode, they weren't all ridiculously overpowered. Adventurer's Guild House says what's up. I mean, that thing didn't even tap for mana and banding let's just move on and keep talking about the actual overpowered land in question library of alexandria is absolutely terrific and goes in every single cube deck yes all of them even the aggro ones yes even mono red because if you decide to start your onslaught on turn two instead of turn one but you get a completely free howling mind just for yourself to have and hold and call snookums then you just do it you just run it this card is a windmill slam for all decks of all shapes and all sizes if you have to discard on turn two it's totally worth the card drawn selection people and late game yeah you're still tapping for mana super pimp version ha they ain't ever gonna make a promo of this thing why because the reserve list sucks that's why thanks wizards sure i'm glad you're never going to repent library of alexandria right alongside never reprinting to fairies imp gotta keep that power level in check y'all number three upheaval now, here is a card that gets no respect. I've played in cube draft after cube draft where this thing wheels or passes out, particularly online. No respect to tell you guys, no respect. Upheaval is a card that so easily crushes those who it is cast against, it's crazy. For those unclear as to why this card is listed above stuff like Elspeth and Library of Alexandria, just imagine yourself in a scenario in which you've ramped up your mana to way past six to, let's say, I don't know, nine or ten. You tap your lands, your grand monolith, your thran dynamo, and all that good stuff stuff you cast upheaval you pick up everything and then you lay down something dumb like an elspeth or a dragon or a hexproof guy or just redrop all of your mana makers and play something ridiculous next turn this is an incredibly powerful card because it resets the game almost entirely in your favor even against fast aggro decks you're starting them back off at turn one whereas you're already after casting upheaval you got mana you wouldn't normally have until turns three or four of any other game that is a dominating strategy and can quickly crush those who passed it in favor of sexier options now, the most pimp version, the Odyssey foil is incredibly affordable at a whopping eight bucks. Number two, Jace the Mind Sculptor. Oh, the champ is here! Quite simply, the best planeswalker of all time. It is hard to oversell Jace the Mind Sculptor. Could be the best magic card ever printed, pound for pound. What does it do? Hell, what does it not do? Four amazing abilities, one incredibly powerful planeswalker. He slices, he dices, he brainstorms, he unsummons, he fate seals your opponent out of the game, and his ultimate is not as far-fetched as you think. The digital ink that has been spilled for Jace would put the Valdez to shame. Article upon article, even my own videos about he'd never be banned, and then about how he was banned, up to where he was reprinted and from the Vault 20. Much like Black Lotus, Jace the Mind Sculptor will forever be an iconic card in Magic. Its design and power are unmatched and will most likely remain that way for the game's lifespan. To own and to play is to love, and there ain't no card in Cube Draft you'd rather have on your side. Wizards knew they were making him really good. But they had no idea how good. After being kept in check in standard by the Jun Menace, led by Bloodbraid Elf, after that rotated, he simply crushed everything. And in Cube, the crushing continues. The Super Pimp version, the World Wake Foil rules all, still sitting at 800 bucks for your plain pleasure. Number one, Soul Ring. Yep. Good old-fashioned Watsy didn't know what they were doing with spells back in the day, and this is a break in logic and power level that is only rivaled by Moxon and Powered Blue spells. But it doesn't matter, because there is no card you take over Soul Ring and Cube. Nothing. Not one. No, not that one. Or that one. Or those. Or him. Quit it. 
This card is sweet and puts you so far ahead that many cube designers just don't include it, simply because it can warp entire drafts around its existence. Going from turn one soul ring to turn two four mana spell is often backbreaking, particularly if it's a planeswalker like Elspeth or Jace or a Johnny. This burst in mana at a rate that is literally second to none is your way to boost ahead of whatever your opponent is doing. That includes powering up upheavals or equipping Umazawa Jites. Many cube designers decide to leave out Soul Ring and Power because of the incredible swings those cards can provide. Soul Ring on turn one is incredibly difficult to beat, but it's not impossible. And I've always felt that the best cubes can design around their inclusions. For example, I am sure there are plenty ways to answer Library of Alexandria in my cube, though some colors get more options than others. And similarly to Soul Ring, either you've got a way around it, or you're pithy needle in it, or you're just trying to race it. But when it comes to powered cubes, make no mistake, Soul Ring rules all. Super Pimp version, a mint alpha soul ring currently resides at a whopping 180 bucks. So why not get two and ship one to me? I could totally use it. But for those who like foils, the Judge foil is really nice and will only set you back a hundo. And that's it for my first ever top 10 show. I hope you guys liked it. And if you did, please tell me in the comments. You can like below and subscribe and all that good stuff. You can find me on Twitter. And if it makes you super happy, it makes me super happy and it makes me make more videos. Now, the best part, I'll be awash in Theros spoilers this weekend after PAX. So keep your eyes glued for those and more coming soon. Until next time, Magic players, this is Evan Irwin. Tap in the cards so you don't have to. like the fatties.